Penny and I lay in bed and read, as we did every night before bed. I am a hunting catalogue, and my wife has been reading a trashy romance novel for two years now. The kind that featured a bare-chested Adonis on the cover, his blonde mane blowing in the wind as he clutched a scantily clad girl with huge, heaving breasts. Penny broke the silence with a question that will ring in my ears forever. What would you do if you found out that I was having an affair? I didn't say a word. I just reached over to the nightstand, pulled out my special 38, took the safety off and fired, blowing a hole right between my wife's eyes. In fact, the bullet tore through the 16 X24 glamour photo she gave me for my birthday last year. There's a nice hole in the wall behind it, and the vinyl siding will need to be fixed as well. Damn, that little gun was loud. Without protection, my ears were ringing. Penny, to put it politely, stained the sheets. When she calmed down enough to speak, she screamed, Are you crazy? Why the hell did you do that? She was still shaking. To answer your questions in order, first of all, no, I'm not crazy. And secondly, to show you what would happen if you ever cheated on me, only I would shoot your pretty face and not your picture. But first, I will make you watch me execute the cheating bastard who desecrated our marriage vow. Suffice it to say that I knew for sure that at 11 in the morning she would be committing adultery with her boss, one Roger Lamphere, 57, in our bed. When I arrived home at 11.10, my heart was pounding with joy because the driveway was empty. I prayed that my facts would be wrong. However, I needed to get inside to make sure no one was home. Our house has a side garage, and I was able to pull into the driveway without being seen from the master bedroom. When I opened the garage door, I almost threw up. Next to Penny's BMW stood someone else's black Mercedes. I knew what I had to do. I took a deep breath and calmly loaded the 12-gauge pump-action shotgun with six high-velocity rounds. These were duck rounds that spat out steel that was shot over a hundred feet into the air. I made a circle and slowly opened the door. On the floor of the Italian marble hallway lay a pile of discarded clothes that Penny simply had to have. Fury boiled over when I saw my birthday present for her hanging from the railing, a pair of lace panties and a bra that my wife had yet to wear for me. As I walked up the spiral staircase, I heard them having sex like animals in our marital bed. No words, only guttural sounds, like two lovers who cannot speak. The door was open, and I could see Lamp here pounding my wife and his fat white ass shaking with every thrust. I waited until he stood up straight and then walked up behind me so Penny wouldn't see me. I really wanted it to be a surprise. Once he had a good rhythm, I aimed the gun about six inches from the base of his skull and pulled the trigger. Fire erupted from the barrel, and a hundred pea-sized steel pellets pierced his head. I was amazed to see his body give two more thrusts before collapsing onto Penny. I think it took his brain a while to tell his body that it was going to spend eternity in a disgusting box. Penny let out a single scream as the bright red blood and gray matter of his brain sprayed onto her. Then she fell silent. She fainted. I had never killed anyone before and didn't know what to do. I really wanted to talk to Penny before I executed her. So I rolled the dead bastard off her and onto the floor. The bullets made a neat hole about an inch in diameter in his forehead. Until today, every dead person I have ever seen has been made up by an undertaker to look like they are sleeping. No, Lampery looked very dead and would not be buried in an open casket. He fell to the floor with a thud, and then I saw that his eyes were still wide open and looking at me. I have to admit this made me nervous, so I pulled the blanket off the bed and threw it over the corpse. After a few minutes of waiting, I started to get impatient. I went to the bathroom, poured a glass of cold water, and splashed it on Penny's face. She sat down and shook her head. She seemed to be trying to figure out if it was all a bad dream. She realized this was not the case when she ran her hand over her face and found Lampier's blood on her hand. I could see that she had realized the reality of her predicament by the sheer horror in her eyes. She tried to scream, but fear did not allow the sounds to escape. The only sound was her gasping for air, like an asthmatic trying to take a breath. All too soon it gave way to her banshee-like screams. I was starting to worry that I wouldn't have the heart to shoot her, 
I mean, it's one thing to shoot a fat fuck in the back, but it's another thing entirely to kill the woman I loved. I mean, I'm an accountant, not a hitman. You know I get angry when you cry. I'm telling you right now, stop this crap. It won't help you at all. I offered her a towel to wipe the blood from her bare chest. She began to speak, but her lips trembled so much that I could not understand her. I told her to calm down and take a deep breath, because I wanted to hear what she had to say. After a couple of minutes, I was finally able to make out. I will die. Remember what I told you? What I would do if you had an affair? She nodded her head. Can you give me one reason why I shouldn't kill you? She had the most perplexed expression on her face, as if she was rummaging through the depths of her mind to find the wonderful words that would commute her death sentence. Finally, she muttered, No, you've been my wife for seven years, so I'll give you seven minutes to make your peace with God. I warn you, if you decide to talk me out of murder, I will blow your head off at that very moment. I looked at my watch and said, Time has passed. Penny closed her eyes, and I assumed she was praying because I could see her lips moving. Then she opened her eyes and moaned pitifully. Five minutes. I'm so sorry. I screwed up. I'm a slut. Four minutes. Penny fell silent. I wonder what I would do if I only had four minutes to live. I looked at my watch. Three minutes. Matt, I'm so scared. Me too. Tears rolled down my cheeks. Two minutes. Will it be very painful? Close your eyes. You will open them in heaven. Penny began to sob louder, but finally managed to say, Please shoot me in the chest, not in the face. I nodded and pointed the gun at her heart. Goodbye. The characteristic metallic sound with which the shutter clicked, firing a 12-gauge cartridge, echoed throughout the room. I love you. I love you too. I pulled the trigger and ripped the life out of my wife. The shot made a hole in her chest the size of the hole she left in my heart. I sat next to her lifeless body and cried for at least an hour. Then I took out a notepad and began to write my confession. I started by talking about the hole in the picture and ended with the words, I am a man of my word, and I kept my promise to my wife. My stomach growled and I realized that all I had eaten all day was a cup of coffee. If I call the police right now, I'll be lucky if I can get something to eat before tomorrow morning, I thought. And then inspiration struck me. Pizza. I went downstairs and found a menu for an Italian restaurant next door that delivered food. I thought this would be the last pizza I would ever try. I opened what would no doubt be my last bottle of beer and wrote a note to my brother while I waited. I told him how to dispose of my property and bank account information. I put Penny's insurance policy, whatever cash I had on hand, and a set of keys in a priority mail envelope, sealed it, and then put the correct postage on it. Thirty minutes later, the doorbell rang. I handed the delivery guy twenty-five bucks and said, Keep the change. I made his day. I wasn't sure if it was real or not, but I remembered that in almost every detective show the bad guy's belt and shoelaces are taken away so he doesn't hang himself. I knew there would be television cameras in court, and I didn't want to walk around like I was homeless. I went to the bathroom and took what I expected to be my last hot shower, then changed into comfortable pants that didn't need a belt and a pair of moccasins. To make sure my story got out, I made copies of my confession and mailed them to two reporters whose names I recognized from the front page of the local newspaper. I wanted to make sure everyone knew why I did it. I walked about a half mile to the pharmacy and dropped the envelopes in the mailbox. Returning, I realized that I was taking my last walk as a free man. Ten minutes later, I took one last walk through our house, ending in the master bedroom. I kissed Penny goodbye one last time and went downstairs to call the police. I placed my signed confession on the floor next to the disassembled shotgun. 911. What is your emergency? My name is Matthew Weiss. I just shot my wife and her lover. I have your address. Toe 201 Morrison Street. Yes, ma'am. They're in the upstairs bedroom. I'm sending a patrol car and an ambulance. I warned the officers that you were armed. Please state your intention. No problem, ma'am. Tell the officers that I will not resist. The front door is wide open and I will be lying face down with my fingers clasped behind my head. 
A couple of minutes later, the first patrol car arrived. It took them almost that long to come in and handcuff me. I was driven to the station in the back seat of an unmarked car. The next couple of days pass in a blur. I was glad I ate before giving in as I was interrogated nonstop. I should mention that I live in a nice, quiet residential area, and this was the first double murder they've ever had. Everyone seemed to want to talk to me. I kept telling them that I had explained everything in my confession, but they still insisted on questioning me. The detective interviewing me kept asking if I had ever thought about suicide. My answer was always the same. I only did what I gave my solemn word. And a person who does not keep his word is not a person. He became even more angry when I refused to tell him how I found out that my wife was having an affair and, more specifically, when she would have a date with her lover. His bizarre words did not loosen my tongue because I was sworn to secrecy. And I am, after all, a man of my word. I couldn't tell how much time had passed because there was no window or clock in the room, just a metal table to which I was handcuffed and two chairs. Later, in what I assumed was early evening, a state police investigator took over the interview. He seemed like a pretty nice guy. He even offered me a cup of coffee. The taste was hellish. I told my story again. He thanked me for my time and said he would return when it was time for me to go to court. I was then examined by a psychiatrist to determine if I was going crazy. When he asked if I felt remorse, I replied, No, I feel betrayed. I was betrayed by a woman who promised before God and people to leave everyone else. Then I added, I had to do what I did, otherwise I wouldn't be a man. He was not very happy with my answers. We had a long argument about my morals and ethics for what must have been two hours before he announced that he had what he needed. I was shackled and taken back to my cell to await the next inquisitor. The next morning, I was brought before a judge to face charges. After the indictment was announced, I was asked if I admitted my guilt. Guilty, Your Honor. My court-appointed lawyer, who looked like he was straight out of law school, shouted, No, Your Honor. My client did not do this. I mean, it was a crime of passion, and I declare his temporary insanity. I also vigorously objected that I was not crazy and that I knew what I was doing. I shouted, Your Honor, may I please speak? There was a loud roar from the audience. There were shouts, Let the murderer speak! Others suggested how to put me to death. One man in a bad suit pushed forward. Thompson from the Times... I received your confession by mail, Mr. Weiss. Is this reliable? I answered. Yes, my confession is real, and a couple of burly sheriff's deputies pushed me out of the courtroom. I never heard back from the judge. I spent another wonderful evening at the Gray Bar Hotel, complete with room service. After eating a sausage sandwich, potato chips, and green beans, I sat on my bunk and stared at the wall until the lights went out. That night, the worst thing happened. Matthew Weiss woke up but couldn't move. He thought he was having a lucid dream from which he could not wake up. He started to panic. He felt like his pillow was soaked in sweat while the rest of his body was cold. He tried to call but could not. The only thing he could do was blink. When the jailer came in the morning to count the prisoners, he ordered Weiss to get out of bed. When he didn't, he called for backup before unlocking the cell. It didn't take them long to realize he wasn't faking it. Matthew Weiss was paralyzed after a stroke. Paramedics appeared and carried him to the ambulance. He was taken to county hospital with his right wrist handcuffed to a gurney. The next thing he knew, he was lying in a bed with a web of wires and tubes connected to him. He overheard someone explaining that he had had a massive stroke, but it looked like he would live. Six months later, he could move his left arm enough to feed himself. He didn't say anything else. The county doesn't spend much money on physical rehabilitation for convicted killers. So Matthew Weiss spent the rest of his life sitting in a wheelchair, staring at a wall. Sometimes the minimum wage intern would turn on the TV. It didn't matter because he lived in his mind, reliving his marriage, fast-forwarding to the bad times and dwelling on the good. He also had great philosophical disputes regarding his final judgment. He was convinced that he would be reunited with his wife. Ten years later, the angle of death took the soul of Matthew Weiss. He died with a smile on his face. When a reporter called to tell Mrs. Lamper that her husband's killer had died, 
She smiled, too. She smiled because her secret died with him. No one will ever know that it was she who made the phone call that forced Matthew to prove that he was a man of his word. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.